Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Tristan Claridge and I'm the convener of the Social Capital Research Group. Um, our group has really been gaining momentum over the last couple of years and we now have a, a Facebook group with over a thousand members and we hold regular webinars uh, with invited speakers. So in this session, we have a, a presentation by Kennedy Segodo, um, who's going to be giving us a, a talk about using social capital in interventions to promote mental health of young people. And, and Kennedy is doing a Delphi study, um, which is kind of really interesting looking at the, the opinion of experts on this topic. So Kennedy is a, a do doctoral candidate from Glasgow Caledonian University under the supervision of Professor Anthony Morgan. Kennedy's research interests span asset-based community health and child and adolescent mental health. He focuses on exploring the utility of social capital in mental health uh, programs, and his current work, he is developing a social capital theory of change to promote mental health of young people. The output will be a testable framework that can be utilized and adapted to inform mental health interventions in multiple settings. So over to you, Kennedy. Well, um, thank you, Tristan, and welcome everyone to today's presentation. I'll first of all begin by thanking Tristan for providing me this opportunity to share some of the work that I've been doing uh, for my doctoral research. I've gained a great deal from this forum, so thank you, Tristan. Um, well, as I would repeat, my name is Kennedy and I'm a doctoral candidate at the Glasgow Caledonian University. And I would be talking about um, the findings from one of the studies I conducted for my doctoral research. And my uh, study is titled Social Capital as a Theory of Change for Promoting Young People's Mental Health. So in today's presentation, I'll begin by introducing the project under which my doctoral research is housed. Then I will look at the background, um, and by the background, I'll specifically focus on social capital, uh, social capital and mental health, and uh, I'll briefly introduce social capital interventions. I'll briefly mention what I did uh, in terms of the method I employed to collect my data. And then I will spend, um, a substantial amount of time sharing with you the findings that are obtained from this exercise. So this PhD is part of a larger project that seeks to understand the link between social capital and mental health of young people. The research project um, mostly comprises of uh, groups of academics and researchers who are based at Glasgow Caledonian University in the United Kingdom and Hampstead University in Sweden. I'm currently undertaking my studies with the directorship of Professor Anthony Morgan. Um, my second supervisor is Professor Jens Nigren from, from Hampstead University in Sweden. And my third supervisor is Dr. Kerry Markfusson, who's also from uh, the Glasgow Caledonian University in the UK. So I'll begin by giving the background on what social capital is. And for those who are familiar with the concept of social capital, uh, you definitely have come across myriads of definitions. So I'll sort of steer clear the debate on definitions. But then for those who are joining this session who haven't had any prior experience to social capital, the concept is basically built on the fundamental idea that social networks are valuable asset for individuals and communities. So in an actual, you tend to say that the concept behind social capital is basically relationships do matter. Well, there are two main approaches that have been used to study social capital. And this is the network-based social capital approach and the cohesion-based uh, approaches to studying social capital. So the network-based approaches refer to resources that are generated within social networks. And these social networks could be comprised of individuals or homogeneous groups or groups of people with high similarities. And most of the time we call these horizontal networks. And that's it what we'll term as bonding. Whereas these networks can also comprise of heterogeneous group or individuals who are dissimilar in their characteristics, be it their professional roles or their socioeconomic status. That is what we call bridging social capital. The cohesion-based approach signifies membership in social organizations, and that is the structural dimension. It is also concerned with the perceptions of the quality of social relations, and that is what falls under cognitive social capital, where we talk of norms, where we talk of trust and other constructs. 
Social capital is a concept that was conceived and has largely developed around, uh, around adults. And so it is imperative that we as social capital researchers would sit back and try to understand how this concept has been applied to young people. And so despite the fact that um, the founding fathers of this concept tended to portray young people as mostly passive uh, when it comes to benefiting or creating social capital, Indeed, recent research has shown that young people are actively involved in not only creating their own networks, but also helping adults uh, connect with each other. And so that's what makes it quite relevant. And in fact, this is being supported by uh, proliferation of studies that are showing how important this uh, concept is to young people. We've all known that in the public health, you're moving to, or we are currently working in the era of social determinants of health. We all believe that um, health is not just the absence of disease, and we believe that myriads of social factors influence our health outcomes. So one of those factors, one of the social factors that influence our health outcomes is the relationships and the networks that we engage in or belong to. So what social capital adds, as Eason and Silva will put it, that social capital basically adds the aspect of quality and quantity to social relations. In addition to being social relations as social determinants of health, we're bringing in the aspect of what sorts of quality characterize these social relations and what sorts of quantity are needed for these social relations to have influence on uh, health outcomes. So just as in adults, the same applies to young people. And so there's also lots of evidence that has shown all that links social capital, so relationship of children within their families or within their neighborhoods and schools to both positive and negative health outcomes. And as I was chatting with Tristan uh, before we started uh, this presentation, we we're thinking about the revolution that has happened in public health. And I was talking about the new public health and some of the aspects or some of the approaches that we're currently applying in public health are asset-based public health. And so asset-based public health is basically concerned with what are the assets within the communities that can be used to promote mental health of young people. And indeed, social capital stands out as one asset that could be useful in promoting mental health of young people. And so the next bit of uh, item would be to ask ourselves then what do we mean by social capital intervention? So social capital intervention has been uh, defined as an intervention that seeks to strengthen relationship in a given community and all collaborations within or between community members. But what this defini definition shows is that any intervention that seeks to either strengthen relationships or increase collaborations within community will ideally uh, be termed as a social capital intervention. But then this is uh, disputed by Mo et al, who claim that uh, without a clear identity, the concept of social capital intervention risks being essentially all things to all people. And for them to move this definition from a more general to a more specific definition, they include the aspect that these interventions have to be informed by social capital theory. And so in their definition, they define social capital interventions as population health interventions in which network social capital theory informs the design and character of the intervention. The wider aim of this PhD project as a whole is to develop a social capital theory of change for promoting mental health of young people. In order to achieve this aim, I mapped out three objectives. The first objective was to map the existing literature on conceptualization of social capital and young people. As I've mentioned before, that social capital has largely um, been uh, developed around adult populations. And so it has had adult-centric origins and development and so I thought it would be really important to identify how this concept is conceptualized for these uh, subpopulation, that is children and adolescents. My second objective was to identify how best to apply social capital or mental health interventions for young people. Much has been written out there, but then I wanted to know which one would be determined um, as the best way to apply social capital theory in mental health interventions. <clears throat> 
And these will be the findings that I'll be presenting in today's, uh, in today's presentation. My third objective is to validate the theory of change that comes out of these uh, first prior objectives and achieved by those two methods. And so I've just recently uh, collected the data to validate uh, this TOC and it involved interviewing uh, children in Kenya. So I'll move on to discuss um, what I did. So I applied the, uh, the approach of the Delphi process and um, Delphi is an iterative uh, or it's a consensus building technique. And being iterative, it basically means that it doesn't happen uh, just in one round. So it happens over multiple rounds. Studies that have been done prior using this process have ranged between two to four rounds. And so my study um, only went for two rounds. And so what I went was, uh, how I went about it was recruiting uh, participants. And after recruiting these participants, they were uh, welcomed or invited to take part in uh, filling a web-based questionnaire. And so they completed this uh, questionnaire that had questions designed specifically to identify uh, aspects to do with social capital theory of change. And after these experts had uh, completed uh, this questionnaire, uh, they were analyzed and the findings were summarized. And then this summary was shared back with uh, the fit, uh, with, was shared back to the participants. So basically it involved telling participants that this is what um, the findings have revealed from the round one. So this is what participants have stated here. And this is um, some of uh, areas where there's some, some sort of agreement and some sort of disagreement, and perhaps also asked whether um, these participants could either take back what uh, they had answered in their first round or whether they could give more justification as to what their answers were. So this other round involved not only distribution of feedback, but also collecting responses from these participants. So being a two round Delphi study, the second round was basically a repeat of what had happened in the first round. But then the only difference is that the round two questionnaire was designed um, using questions uh, developed from the responses and the feedback that was obtained from uh, the first round. So if there was any contentious issue, if there was any issue that required a follow-up in order to get more clarification, then those are the questions that constituted the second round questionnaire. So this, uh, the participants or the experts had an average um, of 11.4 years in terms of experience. Um, the professional background was mostly, so these experts were from academia and uh, there were others from, um, from the practice world. So these were considered as practitioners. And then there were participants who straddled, who straddled both academia and, uh, and practice. And so we had uh, academics, we had practitioners, and the third group of um, professionals were termed as practicing academics. So most of the experts uh, in this study were from North America and Europe, and that perhaps could show us the sort of um, Euro-American dominance when it comes to research on social capital, because you'll see that most of them were from Europe and North America, and that just shows that there's some sort of imbalance between the amount of research, especially on social capital and its application on health outcomes uh, split between um, North America, Europe and Africa and Australasia, because there are only four participants from Africa and four from Australia and Asia. So the first round involved 24 uh, participants and uh, due to attrition, we lost three. So in the second round, I only had 21 participants. The would tend to believe those who've undertaken Delphi study before. Attrition is always one of the problems that you really have to deal with. Perhaps I think participants get tired of getting um, different rounds of questionnaires over time. So losing three was quite an achievement. So I've structured my findings um, under four headings, and these four headings correspond with uh, the generic theory of change framework that I'm using. And so my findings have been classified under interventions where I'll be looking at the nature of actions required to obtain social capital outcomes. 
And then the other bit is on the pathway. And this basically shows the processes that uh, link social capital action to mental health outcomes. Then the other bit is on tracking progress and measuring changes affected by social capital. And then I'll also look at some of the contextual variations or environmental conditions that are important for the success of social capital interventions. But following some responses um, I had obtained when recruiting participants for the study, I have participants who declined to, uh, to take part in this study. And uh, some of the reasons they gave was that they have since moved on from this concept of social capital and that they didn't think it was worthy to stand as a concept. And so it appeared that the use of the term social capital was uh, not really welcomed by all scholars or, or researchers or practitioners. And so this intrigued me to pose a question to these experts. And I asked about their perspectives on the use of the term social capital in interventions. And it came out that 64% supported the use of the term, some unreservedly, others with the reservation. And those who supported the use of the term social capital uh, tended to think that uh, being able to apply this concept took precedent over defining the term or using the term. So applicability and acceptability was more important than the terminology. Those who expressed um, that it was okay to use the social capital term stated that if you're going to use this term, then you better define it. And so for them, it was okay to use the term social capital as long as the person who was using this term, whether it was a practitioner or whether it was a researcher writing a paper, it was imperative that they had to define what exactly they mean by the term social capital. Those who accepted the use of social capital reservedly thought that uh, there should be some sort of a minimum threshold that one has to attain to use the term social capital. As I would quote one of my participants or one of the experts who stated, I think it is a great mistake to say that one is evaluating or promoting social capital when only trust or social cohesion is being considered. So according to this expert, he thought that you wouldn't ideally have the authority or you wouldn't confidently say that you are um, addressing social capital or researching social capital if you're only talking about one or two constructs. And so he thought that you have to have a certain number of constructs for you to confidently and with authority claim that you are working with the concept of social capital. The other group were people who are opposed to the use of the term social capital in interventions. And for them, they viewed social capital as a vague and often confusing uh, term. And for them, they uh, suggested that perhaps people could use alternative terms such as uh, community development or social cohesions that they thought were much more clearer and much easier to understand. So this has always come up, especially for those who seek funds uh, from uh, donors in terms of they will tend to argue that it's quite difficult to make a convincing case that you, uh, your project is based on social capital, which uh, seems not to have a clear or direct meaning. And so they tended to argue that aspects such as community development or social cohesions would uh, ideally be more clear alternatives to the use of social capital. So to look at the interventions, I needed to get uh, the answer to the question on practical application of social capital in public health interventions. So I asked the experts whether processes linking social capital to mental health could be simulated in public health interventions. And it was quite surprising that despite the fact that um, one of my criteria was seeking people who've authored extensively on social capital and people who are actively practicing or running interventions uh, informed by this uh, concept, 54% agreed that indeed we could simulate processes linking social capital to mental health in interventions, whereas 46% disagreed. And so for me, I thought that this was not just a clear cut um, agreement, but it was sort of disagreement um, on whether indeed we can either build or create uh, social capital through public health interventions. And the beauty of uh, Delphi study is that you have always have a chance to ask why and to do a follow-up questionnaire that has questions that tend to find out why 
uh, certain variations exist. And so I asked why there was a variation in the perspectives of these uh, participants on whether social capital could be built or created by interventions. And the findings showed that the perceived possibility of simulating social capital in interventions uh, depended on the experts' individual experiences of what works or doesn't work. So if one had a prior success um, in the social capital interventions, then they tended to believe that indeed um, processes linking social capital and mental health could be simulated interventions. And if one had an opposite experience where perhaps that unsuccessfully attempted to uh, apply social capital to intervention, then they uh, would most likely disagree that these processes can be simulated in public health interventions. So other experts made the decision uh, to agree or disagree on possibility of creating or building social capital uh, based on the social capital constructs uh, that they had in mind. So to these experts, some constructs were deemed as easy to simulate in intervention than others. Yet another factor or another criterion that uh, determined whether they would agree or disagree uh, uh, with the uh, concept of uh, applying or simulating social capital in interventions was uh, contextual factors. And so to them, it was all about the context. It was either possible or impossible, depending on the context that you're seeking to um, apply this intervention or implement this intervention in. And so I was really intrigued um, by the second criterion where participants are delighted that some constructs of social capital are easily amenable in interventions. And that formed the next set of questions uh, that sought to explore the easy and the difficult constructs to simulate in interventions. So what I did was that I listed the range of social capital constructs uh, that I had extracted uh, from the responses on pathways and asked the experts to choose whether a given construct was easy or difficult to manipulate in intervention. So the blue color represents um, easy, whereas the orange color represents difficult, and the height of the bar uh, represents the proportion of experts. So the long, the taller the bar, then the more experts um, think it is easy or it is difficult. So what appears from this graph is that uh, more professionals thought that it was easy to influence uh, aspects such as social engagement, social relationships, increase social interactions, increase awareness or role modeling, or perhaps improve connectedness of these young people. And that is contrary to what appears at the extreme, extreme right of this graph, where we find that most experts thought that these constructs on the extreme right were quite difficult to simulate in interventions. And such constructs included aspects such as social norms, uh, empowerment, aspects such as sense of belonging, reciprocity, and trust, just to mention but a few. And so I was really interested and I, I wanted to know uh, what was their criteria of determining whether a construct was easy or difficult to simulate in intervention. And there were four main criteria and the first one was the dimension of the construct. And so by dimension, the, pan the panelists or the experts um, agreed um, that it was much easier uh, to simulate structural social capital and uh, in interventions, and it was quite difficult uh, to simulate cognitive constructs of social capital. And so structural social capital came out as easy to enhance artificially, and by the nature of um, increasing networks or creating connections, it seemed that it was more dynamic and easy to change as compared to cognitive social capital that would perhaps um, take much longer time and appear to really require much in terms of changing people's subjective experiences. Another criterion was the level of intervention. And so the experts showed that constructs that were applicable at individual level were deemed easier to simulate or easy to simulate in interventions compared to those that were perceived to be applicable at community level. And so what made community level uh, interventions um, 
to be perceived as difficult was uh, basically that there were lots of broader social processes that happened within the community. And there was also lots of contextual issues to deal with. And these broader social processes and the context within the broader community made, um, uh, uh, made constructs that are most likely allowed to be, or constructs that are most likely to be simulated at community level uh, difficult. It was also deemed that it was interventionist uh, find it much easier to control um, interventions at the individual level as compared to uh, controlling um, far or extended interventions that mapped or worked within or mapped, worked at the community level. Another criterion uh, for deeming ease or difficulty of a construct was that constructs were deemed to require, so we have the, uh, the constructs that are deemed um, as easy or difficult. And so those constructs that uh, were deemed to require sustained engagement or longer durations, and um, those constructs that perhaps required broader changes uh, to the social or cultural belief and value systems. And these include aspects or constructs such as social norms, such as reciprocity, um, aspects such as trust, that were deemed to require broader changes to the society, and the cultural beliefs and the value system of these societies. So these were considered to be quite difficult in implementing in interventions. In contrast to um, those that were considered to be easily and quickly manipulable in interventions. And so what comes out is that if you look at the dimension, structural dimension uh, tends to involve mostly trying to engineer networks here and there, increase accessibility or create new connections, um, as well as individual level social capital is mostly also inclined to sort of uh, manipulating these networks and making or creating uh, connections for individuals and creating ties for individuals. And that's also what we can see when it comes to the nature of action needed, that it is much easier indeed to create um, connections or to create or to increase engagement or to increase social interactions, while it is much more difficult uh, to perhaps change uh, the level of trust in a community or perhaps change the social norms that have been part of these communities for longer. And so the dichotomy of the ease and difficulty is sort of related across these different criteria. And finally, the other criterion that was used uh, for determining ease and difficulty was uh, applicability um, of the given construct um, to young people. As I'd mentioned uh, previously in my background is that social capital is a concept that has largely um, it was initiated and has largely developed around adults. And it is only recently that uh, researchers have begun trying to understand how these constructs within social capital can be um, applied to young people and how these concepts can be conceptualized to fit within the social lives of young people. And so the panelists or the experts cited that an aspect's applicability to young people uh, could be why it may be deemed as easy or difficult to influence in interventions involving this population. So you might find that the meanings of these constructs vary with age. So for instance, uh, what is meant by trust uh, or empowerment could be different for a 14 to 19 year old individual as compared to someone who is in their 30s or 40s. And so that was also one factor that uh, made certain constructs to be deemed as easy or difficult to um, simulate in interventions. So you come to the point where we look at some sorts of uh, interventions when you talk of social capital interventions, what types of interventions will qualify as social capital interventions? So this was a whole um, a range of social interventions that I believe uh, some of us who've been working in public health could have uh, come across. And this included aspects such as network identification, uh, social prescribing, um, education programs that tend to increase awareness of, um, of the benefits of belonging to networks or, or building ties within communities. We also have in interventions that look at financial interventions or school-based interventions that perhaps uh, look at issues such as 
enhancing teacher-student relationships, etc. So what came out was that um, interventions that aimed at um, building social capital uh, for children and adolescents or for young people are not specifically targeted to young people themselves. So in addition to there being interventions that are specifically targeting young people, a whole range of these interventions will perhaps be directed to um, either parents or teachers or some aspects of the community. But what was striking was that from all these interventions, they all seemed to have three main action points. So an intervention would be uh, implemented either to initiate connections or relations or networks or to enhance existing connections or relations or networks, or maybe just to create or increase awareness on the benefits of social capital. So when asked about the pathways of change linking social capital uh, to mental health outcomes in young people, the experts explained um, the link between social capital and mental health using statements such as, and I'll quote one of the, ex, uh, one of the experts, social connection validates oneself and contributes to build their identity, which is key to maintaining and developing mental well-being. So what I did to develop this sort of schema or illustration that you can see was basically break down this statement and the first constructs um, will be identified and listed as the most immediate outcome of an intervention. And then the subsequent one will be listed under intermediate outcomes. And then of course, the final bit of it on mental health and well-being would ideally be represented by um, the column on mental health. And so, what appears on this schema is that the interventions immediate outcomes are different levels of interactions. So as you can see, construct of structural social capital tend to dominate these immediate outcomes. Uh, and these constructs include social engagement, uh, relationship, uh, social interaction, social support and connectedness. And then these um, immediate, immediate outcomes would go through process that have ranked as process B. And process B uh, basically represents um, processes that involve maintaining these relations. So for social engagement to be, um, or to lead to improved self-identity in a young person or self-esteem in a young person, then it has to be maintained. So maintaining these immediate outcomes would, adv in a, would eventually lead to development of the intermediate outcome. Another process represented by letter B is mobilization of resources. Once these networks have been either initiated or enhanced or people have become aware of these uh, benefits, then mobilization of resources will ideally also help with the transition from the immediate outcomes to the intermediate outcomes. And what appears is that the intermediate outcomes have some of the factors that perhaps will be considered as um, indicators of mental health and well being. And that is quite interesting because. Uh, some of the constructs in cognitive social capital tend to overlap with some uh, indicators of mental health and well being. For instance, um, constructs such as sense of belonging or self efficacy or self identity would as well, or autonomy, will as well be considered as some aspects of cognitive social capital. And they also usually act as well, uh, they usually act as indicators of uh, mental, and, mental health and well being. So in summary, this, uh, this illustration uh, basically shows that structural social capital is sequentially related to mental health by cognitive social capital. And so cognitive social capital tends to be the more proximal uh, level of social capital to mental health as compared to uh, structural social capital. So some panelists uh, considered that uh, assessment or evaluation was a great hinderer of social capital. So they explained that there were not enough ways of undertaking a complete assessment and that some of the challenges that um, could uh, perhaps hinder assessment or evaluation of social capital interventions would be um, the difficulty in choosing an indicator. And so there's lack of specific indicators as you can see that for you to choose an indicator, you'd either be looking at how you conceptualize social capital, 
what are some of your constructs within your conceptualization and the constructs that you've used to perhaps lead or guide you in um, the sorts of measures that you will use in uh, assessing or tracking progress in your intervention. It also led to, or it also, to evaluation was also linked to um, the intended outcome. So if your intended outcome was a mental health construct or perhaps to looking at mood disorders or internalizing disorders or externalizing disorders, then that as well would uh, perhaps um, determine the sort of scale of the sort of measure that you will use to uh, track the success of your intervention. But then I'm seeking to understand how the challenges could be overcome as evaluation was um, presented as one of the challenges um, in evaluating social capital interventions. Uh, the experts uh, brought in the aspect of holistic assessment of context, that whenever you, you are assessing um, the success or the progress of your intervention, then you really have to put it into context. What sorts of contextual factors uh, did this intervention operate in? Uh, where was it implemented and what were the prevailing circumstances under its imp implementation? The experts also advised that um, uh, the advice again is the, uh, the dominance of quantitative methods um, of assessing or evaluating social capital. And they encouraged that indeed uh, it would be of benefit to involve or include uh, qualitative evaluation methods. And so they advocated for utilizing mixed methods in evaluation. One thing that also came out was that uh, it was imperative to apply participatory approaches to evaluation because these sort of approaches um, enabled participation of young people in these uh, evaluations. And this was linked or associated with successful evaluation of social capital interventions. So most panelists deem social capital to be a highly contextual phenomenon uh, that differs across societies and individuals. So these were based on certain considerations that um, for a social capital intervention to succeed, then there are certain considerations that have to be made uh, with regards to the community, with regards to the young person or the family or the socioeconomic status or the intervention factors. And the output of my research will be sort of a generic theory of change. Uh, by generic theory of change, I simply mean that it will not be uh, contextualized. And for this um, theory of change to be used as a blueprint to develop an intervention for a given setting, then the interventionists or those who will be tasked with designing these interventions have to put into consideration the sorts of factors that they have at play, what contexts um, will they be applying this? And it's by looking at these uh, variations that exist and looking at how these variations could uh, affect social capital, that is the only way that this generic theory of change that will be the output of this study will be contextualized to be applied in different settings. It was also important that uh, by identifying sort of uh, this context, then um, it would be very easy to sort of control um, um, the increase in equality because uh, sometimes you might run an intervention and then there will be people who will disproportionately gain from these uh, interventions. And then there's a group of young people who because of one reason or the other, their situation will be made worse uh, because of um, perhaps their baseline or where they're starting on or because some of the unique factors to them are not considered. And so there'll be a group of young people who are disenfranchised and there are people, a group of young people who be based on their context will gain significantly. And so it is also important that um, these contexts are factored in in order to uh, sort of uh, avoid um, the exacerbation of inequalities that is common with public health interventions. So as I come to a conclusion, uh, the summary of the findings from this Delphi um, basically reiterates that it is way much easier to manipulate structural dimension of social capital and like cognitive uh, dimensions or concept of social capital. It also shows that indeed cognitive social capital is proximal to mental health outcomes when compared to um, the structural, uh, structural social capital. <clears throat> 
And then with regards to evaluation, uh, it is imperative or it is useful to combine uh, both quantitative and qualitative uh, data when assessing the process or the success of interventions. And then uh, the final bit is on context and uh, contexts are crucial not only for the success of the intervention, but also to avert any, um, any opportunities where inequalities within um, the target population for intervention may be exacerbated. So that brings me to the end of uh, my presentation, uh, the findings of my DLP study. So thank you very much for listening and I guess it's now time for questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kennedy. Certainly a really fascinating presentation and congratulations on your research. I think it's, yeah, Delphi studies are such a, an incredibly um, beneficial way to go about collecting data in this kind of context. So, so well done and really interesting findings that are coming out of it. So we'll, we'll have some questions now. A few have been submitted um, already in advance, so we can perhaps start with those. But if anybody uh, thinks of any questions, you can put them into the chat within Zoom, um, or in fact, you can put up your hand um, if you wanna do that within Zoom. You go to the reactions little box within Zoom and you can put up your hand and we'll get to your question as we go through. Um, so for anyone who, who has a question, we'll invite you to unmute yourself to, to ask your question. But if you would prefer not to do that, um, we'd be quite happy to read out the question for you. So just make that clear when, when you ask your question. Uh, so we'll perhaps start with, uh, with Shirley. You have a, a question submitted in advance. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, everybody. Um, okay, so let's have a look. My concern was that if you are doing research across different cultures, that it would be difficult to come to a conclusion because in different cultures, different connections or what have you mean different things. So how could you come to a generic uh, uh, theory of change? if you were having very different cultures? Oh, well, thank you very much, Ali. Um, context is indeed a very, um, a very key thing when it comes to interventions. And um, what I attempted to, uh, to sort of um, address the context issue was to get experts from different uh, parts of the world. And so I tended to, I, I tried finding people from Europe and people from America in terms of uh, thinking that perhaps within their own environment of work could perhaps um, influence the sort of answers that they would give to these uh, questions. Other than that, um, the theory of change that would be the output of this, um, the, the output of this project, as I mentioned, would be generic. And the generic uh, basically uh, won't have, um, it won't factor in any um, context. And that is um, the point that I make when I, state that social capital indeed, as you correctly pointed out, is highly contextual. And so in order to turn this generic theory of change, then you'll have to consider the context um, that in which you'll we'll be applying this intervention. And by considering this concept, you will realize that perhaps uh, what social connectedness would mean in my setting is totally different to what it would mean in, an, uh, in a different setting. And so it's start from that point of trying to understand what this would mean in your context and the point of which you'll be starting in your context. And so that's um, perhaps how I think how my intervention or my generic theory of change will be contextualized to apply to different settings. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shelley. And this is a question that comes up really quite often in, um, in social capital is that in different cultures or in different contexts, you know, how can we sort of understand how social capital may apply in these different, in, in these different contexts? Um, and certainly it's really important to ask those questions, but like you're saying, Kennedy, it's, it's really all about the context. You know, social connectedness is a, is a general concept and it's going to be contextually different in different cultures, in different kinds of social environments, but social connectedness is, is kind of universal to, to human interaction. And the same sort of thing with norms, you know, the, the specific details of norms are going to be very, very different in different contexts, but the, the way in which norms function to influence human uh, action is, is universal across all cultures. 
uh, in that very broad kind of way. And the same thing with trust, you know, trust is again, very contextual and very different. So, you know, all of these things, you know, things like empowerment and sense of belonging and an identity and all of these things that incredibly general, but of course they're going to manifest in very, very different, or not very different ways, but in different ways in those different contexts. And so I think you, you've made that point really well. Yeah. Should we, should we move on to the, to the next um, question? Uh, Marion's helping us with, with ordering these questions. Um, so who was next, Marion? I thought Brian's question was next. Um, I brought that forward. Uh, his, his question, I think, is trying to answer how best generation can remedy uh, the status quo. And I think he was actually talking about uh, bad press uh, Africanism. Brian's that... here. Brian, would you like to Brian, brief, yeah. briefly answer you, ask your question? Uh, Mr. Kennedy, good evening. Yeah. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I've been following your, your research from... Uh, a rather human human rights perspective. I'm doing a research on uh, on poverty in Africa. So I was trying to when I when I saw your research on on Facebook, I was like, oh, okay. So maybe social capitalism can be an approach that we can look at when trying to talk about poverty in Africa as a whole, and the whole the whole general uh, uh, question of being an African and what it actually means and how we as Africans ourselves can uh, sort of uh, sort our own issues uh, with regard to poverty and, and, uh, and uh, the general backwardness, if I might say, because it's a firm belief of mine that we, every year we produce uh, brilliant minds such as yourself. And uh, to some extent I might be liberal and say even myself included, but we still have these problems, like every problem, it's, it's in Africa. So I was trying to, 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 to think uh, of it like uh, maybe what Kennedy is saying might, might be an approach that we have not been uh, uh, taking seriously because we are trying to look at laws and democracy, but still there are problems in the general African uh, setup. So maybe perhaps to make the question slightly easier, uh, to, for you to respond in a way that I can use somewhere else, of course, with your permission, is do you see uh, your concept? Do you see your as a, as a pointer to the ways we can use African problems from within ourselves? How, how are you of this? What do you of all this? Well, um, thank you, thank you, Brian, for that brilliant question. Uh, it's quite, it's quite a big piece. But then, um, would, when it comes to social capital and governance, I would refer you to uh, uh, the book by Robert Putnam, who we've all uh, sort of look as a demigod in social capital research. But so, yeah. in uh, in in Robert Putnam's uh, making democracy work, um, he looks at. Uh, people getting detached from sort of their civic responsibilities. And so social capital could be uh, potentially a tool that can be used to enhance more civic, um, civic responsibility among people. So for instance, um, by bringing in people together, giving them that sense of identity as a community, it will really make them demand for accountability and act in unison. Uh, when it comes to demanding uh, demanding transparent leadership. And so uh, the good thing is that this concept as well is quite dominant in, um, in, the, in the discipline of political science. And so it is definitely applicable when it comes to um, looking at how issues of governance can be addressed by social capital. Uh, regarding your point on, uh, on poverty, um, I also tend to think that um, uh, one thing that stands out, I would speak as someone who comes from Africa, and um, one thing I tend to pride myself in is that we really have a very strong uh, social ties. Um, we tend to have very large families and we tend to have very closely knit communities. And what happens is that rather than just seeing these sort of ties as a liability or of some sort of uh, constraining uh, factors to our development as individuals, but these ties could as well be used as um, 
as assets evolved mentioned. And so we've seen this in different forms of uh, activities that happen within African setups. For instance, um, women groups, what we call table banking, where women come together, they put their resources together and they use these resources to uh, enhance their families and enhance the status within their communities. That's practically social capital in action. Um, and there are lots of, we call them in Swahili, we call them chama, where women come together every fortnight or every week and pull resources yeah. perhaps to support their businesses. And so, yes, I believe that social capital concept has a great potential when it comes to um, not only uh, governance, but also economic emancipation. And so I think it holds, uh, it, holds it is key to um, alleviating uh, what we would call as some of the issues that we are facing within our African setting. Okay, thank you very much, Sakenin. Thank you. Okay. Okay, we're moving on to the next question. Uh, we have one from Annabelle Grant. If you would like to unmute yourself, you're welcome to ask your question. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, so my question was, um, what similarities do you think there'd be in applying, I guess, your findings or I guess the... Um, exploration that you've done into the literature for the population of people living with dementia um, who I guess may share the issues of stigma um, and maybe loss of social capital after they have a diagnosis so I'm quite interested in the sort of their human rights um, rights to rehabilitation thanks honey okay. um, yeah. but yeah I mean I really I just enjoyed um, hearing this idea of you know that people are not so sure about you know what is social capital versus cohesion so um thank you but yeah any thoughts well um annabelle i think we'll uh, go back to uh just a bit of conceptualization and so i think pretty much it will also depend on uh the uh the level of uh, dementia that this uh, person is in because you know they are sort of advanced dementia where individuals can't really uh, participate in meaningful, meaningful social interactions. But then you mentioned that it's the point of diagnosis, so I would tend to think that's just uh, early stage dementia. But then I think as it's as the disease is sort of uh, degenerative and it worsens with time, then I think the needs of these uh, individuals also change with time. And so perhaps what um, what connectedness would mean to you is quite different to what connectedness would mean to someone who's having uh, advanced dementia. So I think it will start from a point of trying to look at what these abstracts or these constructs and social capital actually mean for, uh, for individuals living with dementia. What does it mean to, um, to increase social interaction for someone living with dementia? What does connectedness mean to this person living with dementia? And so I think by conceptualizing how these different constructs mean to this specific population, then I think it will be much easier to uh, to come up with um, or to apply this concept to um, alleviating the, uh, the the state of people living with dementia. But I'm proud to say that um, I have a badge of a uh, friend of dementia, and that's basically just uh, helping communities uh, know what dementia is about and just making sure that people living with dementia are well understood and we know what uh, some of the needs they have. And yeah, so that we can get rid of issues such as stigmatization or making life difficult for them. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Anata. Kennedy, a follow-up question on that um, perhaps is, did any of the experts talk about some of the negative outcomes of social capital that might come about? Because you know we tend to be very heavily focused on, on the positive side, but of course, um, the same sorts of processes can create negative outcomes. And it comes to mind with, with perhaps um, some conditions like dementia, uh, it, it might, may create that sort of uh, stigmatism or some sort of discrimination that might occur from the same sorts of, of social connectedness and social identity and norms and those same kinds of processes. So I was, I was wondering if any of that came up from the experts. Um, yeah, with regards to young people, uh, indeed, um, social capital didn't appear as inherently positive. And there were some sort of negative aspects to social capital as well. And it's really interesting uh, for adolescents because um, the adolescent stage is a stage where a young person is highly impressionable. So they tend to want to identify to, uh, to identify with certain groups. 
uh, they strive to gain acceptance of um, these groups. And so in a bid to try to fit within this mold or try to be accept accepted or try to look like the other people, we might find that some of um, these sorts of networks or relationships would inadvertently reinforce negative behaviors. And uh, especially here in London, we've had issues with, uh, with knife crime, we've had issues with uh, gang-related violence. And these all tend to be among a certain a specific ilk of the community who have probably formed what we we'll call like health damaging bonds. So yes, indeed, uh, some sort of networks and, uh, and connections would ideally lead to negative outcomes. And I think it's, 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 uh, it's really advisable that this has to be put in consideration when, when designing interventions, because it might, uh, we might develop one that is intended to promote mental health, but then end up with something else that wasn't really needed. Right. And quite often, I think social capital research tends to assume that, uh, say, if we want to create social identity, which is a really strong determinant of, of a sense of belonging and solidarity and, and even trust and norms and those kinds of things, that we're creating an in-group. And by creating an in-group, we're also creating out-groups. And that we then potentially see the, the negative kinds of consequences of that, those outgroup effects. But, but of course, whether or not there are outgroup effects is itself quite normative. You know, you can have a very strong sense of belonging for the in group without having, um, so, you know, the negative uh, normative behaviors towards the outgroup. Um, and so I think there's a lot to be done still to really understand the processes by which we can develop social capital in positive ways for the in-group without necessarily creating, you know, these wider implications for the out-group uh, effects. And this is perhaps where the role of social psychology could be really helpful in, in progressing our understanding in this area. Um, and that's why I kind of was asking whether any of the experts have really been talking about these kinds of, you know, negative outcomes that can occur from the same sorts of processes. Yeah, that's well explained, Tristan. <laughs> Thanks, Kennedy. So we'll move on to the next question. I'm not sure that Elias Amando is, is here, um, but they asked a question, what are the indicators uh, that a young man is probably suffering mental, mentally despite leading a normal life? If you had some thoughts on that one. Well, um, I tend to think that uh, it's much easier to diagnose physical illness than diagnosing mental ill health. Uh, we've had situations where people who we really thought were really happy um, have ended up either committing suicide or undertaking self-harm. So what makes a mental health diagnosis quite challenging is that sometimes it's not manifested uh, in the physical. But then um, it all depends on um, it depends on the type of uh, type of the mental condition. So it would be ideally I would tend to think that it might be easy to pick someone who's got bipolar disorder, and so it's quite easy to know that someone is not in their right sense, or either because of mania or depression. But then there are others that are lacking deep within that is really quite difficult to know. I might be speaking to you, but then there's something that's within me that you can't identify despite acting perfectly normal. And so I think that it would be much, it is much easier to identify um, those mental health conditions that have some, uh, some sort of manifestation to the outside world. So for instance, in terms of um, mania or, or depression or anxiety, these are easily, is easily observable. But those that are not easily observable are quite challenging and I wouldn't, I wouldn't really claim that I can, I can identify that. Yeah, absolutely. So Marion, I think you have a question if you want to ask yours next. Yes, thanks, Kennedy. Uh, we've been chatting about it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, my question originally was, and this is sort of, uh, I guess, uh, just a personal hobby, hobby horse that links with social capital. Um, and my question is, uh, if I'm trying to find it, if parental involvement with the school should could be an important intervention here for you, I actually sort of saw that as one of the indicated um, uh, interventions. Uh, is this then therefore an important enabler for positive mental health outcomes of young people. Um, and then in the chat, uh, Peter has actually said, yes, Marion, absolutely, parent-teacher partnership. Uh, so there's actually been looked at 
quite a lot in terms of the parent teacher relationship. Um, but your your views on on that because the the adults can deal with it in to perhaps in terms of the social capital and the the parents and the teachers etc can look at it in the framework of social capital perhaps um, anyway how important is that uh, involvement uh, of the parent with the school and the teachers yeah so uh, i think Mario, that goes um, that goes into uh, what you call the school based social capital uh, interventions yeah. And the uh, school-based social capital interventions, um, we basically focus on looking at uh, social capital relationship between students and fellow students. And then mm. we also think of students and teachers. But then there is this uh, sort of one that connects teachers uh, to parents. And I thought it's quite interesting because um, we find that this uh, school social capital is somewhat related to community social capital and somewhat related to family social capital. There's a way they act in compensatory ways. So if a young person is coming from a family that doesn't really have a so strong social capital, but then they go to a school where they can access the social capital, then it sort of have some balancing effect. And so I tend to think that it's a, it's, it's a really interesting angle to look at social capital interventions for young people, especially in trying to um, influence or trying to uh, enhance either school social capital using if there is more in the community then that might be uh, might enhance the social capital of the school but then if there is not so much in the community bring in community members so I think it could work either way it could work either side of the direction yeah mm -hmm. so I think it's something Thank you. We're, just, we're looking at developing special interest groups. So I'm asking from multiple perspectives. So social uh, so social capital interest, uh, specific areas of interest. So, and I've actually asked Edward to make, if he's got questions, but I think he might have left, Tristan. Well, and also, Peter, if you would like to weigh in on this, feel free to unmute yeah. yourself as well. Go for it. Just give Peter a moment if he if he does want to, to weigh in. Um, also, uh, Kennedy, a couple of people have asked if you'd be willing to share your email address. Uh, they'd like to oh. get in contact with you. Oh yes, yeah. So should I should I type it in the chat? Or... Yeah, if you can po post it in the chat, that that'd be great. Okay, so I'll just pop it in the chat. Okay, I, th I think Edward has has left, so we might uh, move on to the next question. Um, thanks, Kennedy, for posting that email address. So I had a question for you about um, some of the findings that you had. So the, the experts were suggesting that the, the structural dimension was a lot easier to, to intervene in to, to basically change uh, than the cognitive dimension. But it seems that the cognitive dimension is the one that's much more closely linked to the outcomes for mental health. Was, was there much suggestion about how the, the two dimensions are interrelated? So, you know, we can quite easily change the structural dimension, but how that might have a flow on effect to the cognitive dimension and therefore towards mental health outcomes? Well, I think, uh, I think from, the, from what I gathered from the findings was, yes, indeed, they're, they're sort of related. But then what happened was uh, what appeared um, was that so structural social capital seemed to be uh, the foundation. So it, it seemed to, to provide the structure with which we uh, can perhaps develop more trust or develop norms of value. So it appeared to be the foundation or the starting point. And um, the fact that it was much easier to manipulate interventions was considered that um, it, was, it would be much more easier to perhaps uh, increase social networks of young people or increase their connectedness. But then they thought that when it comes to cognitive dimension, uh, these are highly, highly, highly uh, subjective um, constructs. And between their nature of uh, subjectiveness, I think they perceived them to uh, require some, some sort of maybe social construction or maybe you're trying to um, construct or wire societies in order to uh, uh, in order to manipulate or in, to influence some of these constructs. So yes, the sort of relationship is that structural or the structure or the relationship or the network seem to form the foundation of social capital. And depending on how closely neat and resourceful these networks are, then the other aspects of cognitive social capital can be obtained. 
Because certainly in the literature, there's a few different views about whether or not the structural dimension really is um, a precursor to the cognitive dimension, you know, whether or not um, we need the structural dimension in order to create the cognitive dimension or whether or not they're just simply self-reinforcing that um, because social structures provide the opportunity for interaction and communication, they, they create and recreate uh, the nature of the cognitive dimension. Um, and so it seems to me, at least, that if, if we focus on, as an intervention, if we focus on building the structural dimension, that there will be flow on effects to the cognitive dimension. And so we can have meaningful, um, meaning, meaningfully intervene in, in mental health. However, I think also there's some danger in that as well, because as we've already discussed, you know, we can create the, the structural dimension, but we're not then uh, controlling what types of aspects of the cognitive dimension form. You know, we know norms will form, but are they going to be positive or are they going to be negative? And same sort of thing with trust and belonging and all of these, you know, in-group and out-group effects. And so, you know, to me at least, it seems structural is easy, but it also perhaps carries a little bit of risk that the outcomes may not be positive. Well, and I think that links up to the aspect of control. Um, I think uh, interventionist or uh, someone who is running a social control intervention will feel that they're in more, con they're in more control of uh, the networks they create, uh, the connectivity that they bring in, but then they don't really have so much control on uh, those cognitive aspects. So I think uh, the sense of the level of control one has as well could be uh, could be linked to why most people tend to take these network approaches when it comes to developing interventions. Yeah, and a related question. So were, the, were any of the experts really advocating for a, a network approach to social capital where they, where they really equated social capital with the existence of networks? Or was everyone, almost everyone, uh, more focused on more of the cognitive side? So uh, there wasn't really um, a clear distinction because uh, what comes out was mostly from the analysis of the responses. So including the aspect of intermediate outcomes and immediate outcomes all came out from the analysis. But then when, um, when, giving, the the, when giving the responses or responding to the questions, they didn't really um, delineate uh, the line between structural and cognitive. So they just mentioned the constructs. And it was during my analysis that I would perhaps think that this would fall under this dimension or this would fall under this dimension. Yeah, because certainly in the literature, uh, you know, a very strictly network approach that just looks at the existence of a network structure, you know, um, structural holes, uh, a network closure, like that's quite a, a popular approach in the literature, but it's it's sounding like, and I guess I'm wondering how much of that is, is commonplace within application to mental health and doesn't seem like very much. I think the significant I think the significant overlap between uh, between these approaches, uh, especially if we look at the network uh, the network approach to social capital, and then look at the, the structural dimension that perhaps uh, belong to this cohesive approach to social capital. I think there's so much blurring and there's so much gray areas when it comes because in both you're talking about the structure, you're talking about the networks, and you're talking about the ties. So yes, I think um, social capital has. We still have a long way to go in terms of putting clarity into some of these uh, aspects. Yeah, and I have another question about the the slide you put up with the the pathways linking social capital to mental health. Um, but I'm keeping I'm keeping in mind that I'm asking a lot of questions all in a row. So other people feel free to to put something in the chat or, or put up your hand, and we'll we'll ask your questions as well. Um, so in that slide, you had the first step was the the immediate sort of outcomes of social capital. And then you had the intermediate outcomes before the mental health. And it seems to me like the what the experts were saying is a little bit jumbled. You know, you, we seem to be seeing some things in the immediate outcomes that perhaps were immediate outcomes for mental health. But then in the next step in the intermediate uh, column, we were seeing things that were still perhaps reflected the, the what social capital still is and not necessarily also immediate outcomes for social social capital. So it seems like we're, we still aren't really clear on what social capital is and the dynamic nature of, of how social capital, things create social capital that create certain outcomes, that sort of you know clear causality, we, we don't seem to have a cl clear handle on that yet. And the, I think the responses from the experts seems to be reflecting that. 
Yes, uh, indeed true, Tristan. I think we still caught up in the circularity. And uh, it's that the arrow could go either way, just as you rightly mentioned that the arrow, we might decide to switch all the arrows to face this side and it will still apply. So yes, that's one of the contentions of this concept. Absolutely, and it makes, it makes doing research challenging because of those, um, it's multi-dimensional and, and multi-causality in ways that are really complex, makes doing research really difficult. Uh, but I also had a question on that same, I think it was the same, or maybe it was a different slide. Some of the outcomes of social capital uh, were talked about, or some of the intervention approaches. One of them was um, an anti-bullying program. Now, you know, of course, that makes sense when you think about it intuitively. But I was wondering if the experts had, had any ideas about how that actually connected to the what we consider to be aspects of social capital. Like, what does an anti-bullying program change if we look at the aspects of social capital? Well, I really wish I'd followed up that with them, Tristan, but um, I think they listed them when they're just giving a random list of sorts of interventions that they've worked in. But then um, they didn't really expound on how anti-bullying um, interventions could perhaps um, linked with social capital. Because another one in that list as well was the, the free lunch in schools program. So again, you know, we can intuitively understand how that might change, but it seems far less clear, uh, you know, exactly how that actually influences the specific aspects of social capital that we're talking about. And part of the reason I'm asking these questions is because it seems like the list of, of aspects of social capital that we normally provide, uh, you know, trust, norms, sense of belonging, so forth, these are only examples of what social capital really is. Uh, and so sometimes we intuitively understand something like a free, free lunch in schools program to build social capital, but it becomes more difficult to tangibly identify, you know, what aspect of social capital this is actually changing. And so I think that's also another area where perhaps a little more work needs to be done to actually to move away from this, this list of, of examples of what social capital is, trust and norms and belonging and networks, to actually getting to the, to the heart of, of the issue, you know, heart of the concept of what it really is. And so it's not really a question for you, but I wonder if you had any thoughts about how we might go about that. Well, Tristan, I think that would really take us, um, take us to the point where we're discussing um, the definition of social capital intervention. And so the question you're asking, Tristan, is what constitutes an intervention as a social capital intervention? <laughs> right. Is it what you aim to achieve or is it how it is carried out or is it based on the concept that, that it is founded or constructed on? So yes, I think, um, I think there is a need uh, to sort of um, define what social capital intervention is. Because at the moment, uh, as much as uh, they're trying to make it specific, uh, it is still general as it can be. And is that perhaps some of the reason why, you know, on one of the first slides, you indicated that some experts didn't consider uh, social capital to um, to be contingent, or mental health didn't wasn't contingent on social capital. And is that does that just come down to the way in which social capital is defined? Like it is just as simple as that. Yes. Yeah, it all comes down to conceptualization. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there's so much variety, you know, it becomes quite a challenge for us to talk about something that is defined so differently. We need to kind of define it to be able to talk about it. Absolutely. <laughs> so there's it a makes complex. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. So there, there's a question in, in the chat from, from Brian. Uh, feel free, Brian, to unmute yourself and ask that question if you would like. And anybody else who has questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat or put up your hand. Brian, did you want to ask your question? I'm, I'd be happy to ask it on your behalf if you'd prefer. Yeah, yeah sorry about that. Uh, so Kennedy, there's something you've mentioned that has just caught my attention. Uh, social, social, uh, social networks, when we talk about them uh, and, uh, and the, 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 their value, in, in as far as my earlier question was concerned, you, you said something about resourceful networks. So is this, can I comfortably say that uh, the networks has, have to be resourceful for them to, have, to hold any meaning? Because there are, there are other networks that, uh, especially uh, socially, that are not, are not uh, very nice, like peer pressure, and, uh, and all, 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 all those kinds of things. You see, 
I'm, 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 I tend to think that meetups will somehow be resourceful, as you, as, as you have mentioned. Is this, am I correct in this assumption? Uh, well, uh, Brian, what, what most people have argued is um, that uh, social capital as a term, we all tend to think that uh, capital has a positive connotation. And so the irony is that we also have the downside of social capital, meaning that in this, in this, uh, um, under this concept, then capital is not inherently positive. So people who've disputed the concept of social capital have always brought up that issue that capital should be inherently positive. And so, yes, yeah. uh, that's one of the prevailing debates when, uh, when it comes to the terminology of social capital. But then uh, when you talk of um, resourceful networks, uh, what if you think of networks being a resource on their own? Just the fact that you are all in a network or you're in a close knit community being an asset on its own or being uh, a resource on its own. Without necessarily looking at the, some of the implications that come, come out of it. Um, so that has always been, um, the thing is there are people who argue that, um, uh, there are people who argue that um, economic capital or financial capital tend to supersede social capital and human capital. But then, um, uh, according to one of the authors of social capital, that's uh, that's Pierre Bourdieu. He comes about. Uh, he comes explaining uh, that there is some sort of um, interconvertibility that we can convert these forms of social capital. So, according to me, I would tend to think that you're trying to ask me um, whether we have to have financial capital and economic capital to make social capital work. But my answer would uh, would sort of um, would sort of lean on to what you side where I believe that you can have social uh, capital that can be converted to economic capital and then can be converted to financial capital. I know okay. I sound more philosophical right now, but I hope I've been helpful. Yeah, <laughs> on this matter, it, it should be allowed, I think. So I think also, yeah, thank you. I think also, Brian, the, the one question is what we term, what, how do we define resources? You know, in a, in a resourceful network, are we talking about, you know, resources of trust and, and goodwill and solidarity? Because it's a resource for action. It creates that potential for the sorts of outcomes that we're talking about. You know, or are we talking about resources that are a more tangible, physical kind of, you know, um, resources such as information, perhaps even, you know, physical materials that can be borrowed and shared across the network? Because there's different perspectives in the literature about what these resources actually are. Um, and I think, you know, resources clearly, if we're talking about material resources, then resources clearly play a really important role in, in a lot of the outcomes of social capital. Not so much in relation to mental health, of course, because um, these material resources aren't necessarily required for the mental health outcomes that we're interested in. Um, but if you're, you know, if you're running a business and, and you need access to information or to material resources or to borrow a particular piece of machinery or equipment, then clearly if these resources do not exist within your network, then they can't be borrowed. They can't be loaned and shared and given. You know? so, so clearly those material resources are an important part of the equation, but I think um, a lot of approaches to social capital put them into the context um, they're not necessarily what social capital is, but they're really important as to whether or not in that context certain outcomes can occur. So I think this highlights the, the, the very different kinds of approaches that exist in the literature and the different ways in which even the constituent components of social capital can be defined, you know, resources as relational resources for action or resources as, you know, material goods that can be, can be exchanged, for example. No, I think I think Brian uh, Tristan has really put it into context. <laughs> Thank you, Tristan. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Thank so, you. are there any other questions? Um, Marion had a question about what your publication schedule is, Kennedy. When are you when are you expecting to publish the material from your PhD? Um, well, I would, uh, they're currently in their manuscript forms. Uh, so I was thinking that I had, uh, I was aiming to put down my first draft uh, before extracting them from the main, uh, to the, from the main draft and publishing them. 
So uh, before my submission, that is uh, tentative uh, July or August this year, I should have a few um, publications to type in. Excellent. Uh, so are there any other questions from anyone in the audience? Feel free to put up your hand or even at this point, unmute yourself and, and ask your question or pop something in the chat quickly. I think we're, we're coming towards the end. Thanks, uh, Kennedy. Can you keep us appraised of all of your um, publications and everything like that? As much as I'd love to read your thesis, but... <laughs> and, thanks for, <laughs> and thanks for mentioning Baudieu. <laughs> Baudieu. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So I think since there's no further questions, I think we can wrap up this session. Um, thanks very much, Kennedy, for your for your presentation. I know how much work and effort goes into preparing, so we really appreciate it, and it's been a really fascinating presentation and discussion. So thanks very much. Thank you, Tristan. Uh, so next week we have a, our next webinar will be from Professor Irene Van Staveren, who's going to be talking about social cohesion in co and COVID around the world and looking at the effects on inf infection and death rates. And as we know, social cohesion and social capital are very, very similar concepts. I'm sure she'll be making reference to, to each of those concepts uh, in the presentation. So we'll end the session now. Feel free to stay online if you would you'd like to for a little while and, and have a little bit of informal discussion.